Are you ready for the word? Yes. Turn to Leviticus 23, of course. I was sitting in an airport this morning, very early, and uh, three beautiful points about Yom Teruah just dropped down in my spirit. So I am glad that you're here, uh, giving me an opportunity to share those things with you as well as the people on Facebook Live. The first of the three points that dropped down in my spirit is found in Leviticus 23, verse 1 and 2. <clears throat> Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, say to them, Concerning the feast of Yahweh, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. The word feast used there, translated both times from the Hebrew word moedim. What does moedim mean? Or moed, what does it mean? An appointment, an appointed time, a fixed time. It also means a signal. A signal that is appointed beforehand. Along with all of the other Moedim, Yom Teruah is Yahweh's fixed or designated signal that signals a major event far in event in advance of that event taking place. I did terrible there, so let me say that again. Yom Teruah is Yahweh's fixed signal signaling a major event that is in a distant place, in a distant time, is signaling when that event is going to take place. All Moedim are fixed signals that signal these events. The second point, that's the first point that I said dropped in my spirit this morning, is this is a signal of a future event. The second point is found in Colossians 2, verse 16 and 17. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath day. So there you go, Patty. Let no man or woman judge you because you're celebrating these holy days, right? They will pass judgment on you when you tell them that that's what you're doing. Listen to what it says in verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Messiah. The information given to us here is awesome. In Leviticus 23, we learn that Yom Teruah is a signal of a major event that's going to take place in the future. Now Colossians tells us that it's not just a signal, it's also a shadow of things to come. So both passages let us know that the Moedim are signaling something in the future. Yahweh has a strict schedule. Get that. He has a strict schedule he set in place and he follows that schedule precisely. In Colossians, we're given some information that we didn't get in Leviticus 23 about this schedule. Colossians says that the signal is not just a signal, it's really a shadow of the Messiah. A shadow of Yeshua. Now, now we, we have to get that. It is a signal that is a shadow of Yeshua. It isn't just an event that's marked on the calendar. Everything in the event is revealing to us who the Messiah is and what the Messiah is going to do. Everything in these events reveal to us who the Messiah is and what he's going to do and when he's going to do it. Every major event on Yahweh's schedule signaled by a Moedim is going to be done precisely at that time by the Messiah. That's a massive revelation given to us here in Colossians 2.17. So allow me, if you would please, to summarize these first two points. The Moedim are signals that designate when major events are going to take place. And Moedims are shadows revealing to us 
that these major events will be accomplished by the Messiah. Uh, let's isolate it to, to what we're doing tonight. <clears throat> Yahweh has a schedule that he's following. Yom Teruah is a signal that designates a major event that is going to take place in the future. And Yom Teruah is a shadow revealing to us that the major event will be accomplished by the Messiah, how he will do it and when he will do it. Now point number three we're very familiar with, and that is that Yom Teruah is a shout. The, the signal of the first major event on Yahweh's calendar and Yahweh's schedule was a lamb being slain on the 14th. That was the signal. The, the next signal of a major event was the leaven being removed and eating only, eating only leaven for eating only unleavened bread for seven days. The third signal was a sheaf of wheat that was raised up and waved by the priest on the 16th day of that first month. The fourth signal was a counting that took place. Beginning on the 16th day of the first month, the count included seven Sabbaths, 50 days, where two loaves were waved, signifying the giving of Torah and of the Ruach HaKadosh. These four signals were performed on an exact schedule every year for around 1,600 years, signaling something major that was going to take place. And then, right on schedule and right at the exact appointed time that had been designated by the signals, Yeshua was revealed through those shadows. He was slain, he was buried, he was raised, he sent the Ruach Kakadesh. The fifth signal is the first day, is on the first day of the seventh month, and that signal is a shout. And that signal has been given every year for almost 3,600 years. It is signaling the next major event on Yahweh's schedule that's going to be carried out by Yeshua. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16. For Yeshua himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of Yahweh and the dead in the Messiah shall rise first. So let us not be ignorant. If the first four major events signal the exact day the event would take place, then this fifth signal also reveals to us the day the, that that event will take place. So again, just so we're all on the same page, let me summarize where we are so far. Number one, Yahweh has a schedule. Number two, his Moedim, his feasts are signals letting us know when these events will take place on that schedule. Number three, his Moedim are also a shadow that reveal to us who the Messiah is. Every Moedim reveals to us that the Messiah has already, what the Messiah has already done and how he did them and when he did them. Or it reveals to us things the Messiah will do and when he will do those. Yom Teruah is a signal involving shouting that's re revealing the return of the Messiah. Keep those things in mind and knowing those things to be truth. They are truth. Here are some things we need to know and we need to do tonight. Number one. We need to know this. We cannot get where we need to be if we're oblivious to Yahweh's schedule. <clears throat> I flew to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania early Monday morning and back to Huntsville today. I did not just show up at the airport and get on a random plane and hope it was going to Harrisburg. I know that sounds silly, but think about it. I didn't just go to the airport and say, well, I believe in airplanes, and I believe in an airplane to get me where I need to be, and so I'm going to get on that one. Not what I did. I had to make appointments. I had to schedule every detail of that trip in advance. 
Listen to me here. We used to be lost and wandering around and trying to make sense out of our lives and out of the Bible. And we were sincere and we were trying, but our efforts and our worship and our hopes were far too random to have real significance. We were so confused that we connected the death, burial, and resurrection of our Messiah to Ishtar, Tammuz, bunnies, dyed eggs, sunrise services on Sunday. That's how confused we were. We were trying to get to him, but in actuality, sincerely as we were, we were trying to get to him, but in actuality, we were going the opposite direction away from him. Those activities were not going to get us where we needed to be, no more than it would have been possible for me to show up at the airport and hope that my believing in airplanes were going to get, was going to get me to Harrisburg. The airlines have schedules. The rental car company has a schedule. The hotel has a schedule. In order to be where I needed to be when I needed to be there, I had to become familiar, familiar with those schedules, get appointments with them, show up when they said to show up, and have with me what they told me I had to have. Did you get that? We have to do the same thing spiritually. We had to be willing to become familiar with Yahweh's schedule, show up at his appointed times, and do what he said we needed to do. I'll never forget the first time that I celebrated Passover unleavened bread and first fruits. I had never seen the Messiah revealed to me so clearly as I did through those Moedim. They revealed him to me. I never felt anything celebrating Easter except confusion and ickiness. Right? But the Moedim revealed him to me. Right? It's only through Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits and Shavuot that we began to comprehend who our Messiah is and how awesome Yahweh is. And it's only through Yom Teruah that we're going to be where we need to be, doing what we need to be doing to be ready for what's coming next and what he's going to do next. So Yahweh's schedule is vitally important to know if you're going to get where you need to be. Number two. The takeaway is we never need to treat the shadow as if it's insignificant. That's what that lady told Patty today. That shadow is insignificant. She didn't use those words, but that's what she's saying. So many times I hear those in mainstream denominations ridicule us for keeping the feast. Criticize us even. They say that now that the Messiah has come, there's no need to celebrate the feast because they're just shadows. They ridicule us and they say that we're trying to hug a shadow when we ought to be hugging the Messiah. Any of you ever heard anything kind of like that? Y'all yeah. are hugging a shadow when you got the Messiah here now. The shadow doesn't matter. Hug the Messiah. And they use illustrations like, you wouldn't hug the shadow of your wife, you hug your wife. You wouldn't hug the shadow of your husband, you hug your husband. Why would you focus on the shadow when you got the spouse? Why would you focus on the shadow when you got the Messiah? And that sounds holy when they say it. But it's an error. They miss the point. First of all, we're told in Colossians 2 that these are shadows of things to come. And next, there's no way to eliminate a shadow without eliminating the thing casting the shadow or the one casting the shadow. So by eliminating the shadow, this is important right here. 
by eliminating the shadow, it has allowed many to create for themselves a Messiah who cast the shadow that they want him to cast. They have a Messiah who eliminates the law. They have a Messiah who was uh, born as a sun god on December the 25th. They have a Messiah who rose on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. They've created a Messiah that casts the shadow that they want him to cast. Without the shadow, it's too easy to get tricked into believing in a Messiah who doesn't exist. Too many treat the shadow as insignificant. But the shadow is actually what we have to focus on right now. Listen, I, I don't care how spiritual you are or I don't care how spiritual you think you are. You cannot hug the Messiah. That's right. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. You can't hug him. They say you're hugging a shadow. You ought to be hugging him. You cannot hug him. He's at the right hand of the Father. But, hallelujah, you can hug that which represents him. You, you can show your love for him by embracing the shadows that reveal him. That's what we have right now are the shadows or is the shadow. You can pour your love, attention, efforts, and energies into the Moedim, which will reveal your deep devotion and admiration of Yeshua. What I'm telling you tonight is we need to hug the shadow. Contrary to what mainstream religion tells us, we need to hug the shadow. Get excited about the shadows. Do everything the shadows ask you to do. And do them with all of your might. See yourself loving on Yeshua when you participate in that shadow. When you participate in that Moedim, you are revealing your love, your admiration, your respect, your faith in the Messiah who is casting that shadow. Mainstream denominations say the shadow is just a shadow and we shouldn't be bothering with shadows. Well, I read in Acts chapter 5 where it says that signs and wonders were wrought among the people in so much that they brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and on couches that at the least the shadow of Peter might overshadow them. That Peter passing by his shadow might overshadow them. Now, if the shadow of Peter contained power for miracles to be worked, how much more the shadow of Yeshua? Amen. Tonight during Yom Teruah, next week during Yom Kippurim, Kippurim, and the next week during Sukkot, let Yeshua's shadow overshadow us. Perhaps the miracle that we're desiring and needing will come upon us suddenly while we're under the shadow. So, know the schedule so that you can keep the appointed time. Number two, hug the shadow. And now lastly, we're here tonight to shout with joy. I'm not going to spend a lot of time tonight going over the word Teruah again. We, we have plenty of teachings out there on Facebook and YouTube on the Hebrew word Teruah. The Hebrew word for blow is takah. The most often used word for uh, trumpet uh, is shofar. So if you read the word blow the trumpet, you would expect to see taka shofar. Taka shofar is not in any instruction given to us about this holy day. Uh, those words are not found in Leviticus 23. They're not found in Numbers 29. 
So nowhere is it telling us to blow a trumpet. What it says is you shall have a teruah. And a teruah is a joyful ear piercing sound or shout. Now I think the pattern given to us to know how to do this is in Joshua 6 concerning the walls of Jericho. And if we pay attention to the pattern given to us there, we can ob successfully observe Yom Teruah tonight. So, look in Joshua 6. I want us to read that together. Now, Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, and none came in. And Yahweh said to Joshua, See, I have given into your hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. Not I will give. Not I'm going to give. Not let's give this a try and see what happens. Yahweh said to Joshua, See, I have given. It's already done. It's accomplished. You need to see it as done. See, I have given into your hand Jericho. Then he starts giving instructions on what he wants them to do to bring that into manifestation. Verse 3. And you shall compass the city, all you men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shall you do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times. And the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn. And when you hear the sound or the voice of the trumpet. All the people shall shout with a great shout. Mark those words. Shout with a great shout. And the wall of the city shall fall down. Not maybe, not perhaps. Let's see what happens. He said the wall of the city shall fall down flat. And the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. So the sound of the trumpet was a signal for them to shout. It's amazing that growing up and for most of my life when I heard this story told, the emphasis was put on the shofar as if it had some kind of magical power. I'm not downplaying the importance of a shofar at all. Because the, the shofar was blown every day, encompassing that city. But Yahweh's instruction is plain. When that shofar makes a loud blast, then the people shall shout with a great shout. In the Hebrew, they shall ruah with a great teruah. They shall let forth an ear-piercing sound with a great, joyful shout. The people shall make an ear-piercing, loud, long, mighty shout when they hear the long blast of the trumpet. <clears throat> Again, notice the language. The language speaks of it as a reality. It shall fall down. And Joshua the son of Nun, verse 6, called the priest and said unto them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant. Let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of Yahweh. When Yahweh tells you to do something, you do it precisely the way he says do it. He said unto the people, pass on and compass the city, and let him that is armed pass on before the ark of Yahweh. And it came to pass when Joshua had spoken unto the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns passed on before Yahweh and blew with the trumpets, and the ark of the covenant of Yahweh followed them. And the armed men went before the priest that blew with the trumpets, 
And the rear reward, re reward, the rear guard, came after the ark, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout. Then shall you shout. There's a precise time to do it. So the ark of Yahweh compassed the city, going, it, going about it once, and they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of Yahweh, and seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark of Yahweh went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, but the rear guard came after the ark of Yahweh, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And the second day they compassed the city once and returned in the, unto the camp. So they did six days. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew with the trumpets. Joshua said unto the people, Shout! Ruah! For Yahweh has given you the city. And this city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to Yahweh. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are in her house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you... In any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest you make yourselves accursed when you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel accursed and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto Yahweh. They shall come into the treasury of Yahweh. So the people ruad shouted when the priest blew with the trumpets. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout, Ruad with a great to Ruah, that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. So it wasn't the shofar that signaled the power necessary for the walls to go down. It was the faith and shout of the people that made that wall fall. Uh, fall down and the obedience of the people so the pattern to me is clear here we need to shout for joy but we need to shout in faith we need to shout for joy but it needs to be a shout done in faith what are we signaling for over, around 3600 years this has been done on the first day of the seventh month what's it signaling the king is coming back. The king is coming back. The king is going to come make all things right. All right? The return of the Messiah. And he's not coming to rescue us. He's coming to de defeat all of the enemies of Yahweh. Right? So, the message is, see it. Envision it. Imagine it. Comprehend it. Get it down on the inside of you. Yeshua is returning with a shout. See it. Yeshua's return is imminent. It's going to take place. There's nothing that can stop it. See it. Yeshua will defeat every enemy of Yahweh. And clear the earth of them. Amen. See it. Serving him is not in vain. Amen. See it. Serving him is not too hard. See it. When he returns, you'll be glad you loved him and obeyed him. Amen. You'll be glad for every command that you spent time learning, keeping, and doing. You'll be glad that you were not lawless. See it. If we can see it, if we can see what this day represents, and if we can see how beautiful it is to be overshadowed by the shadow of our Messiah, then we can truly, Ruah, 
with a great Teruah. Keeping <laughs> Yahweh's Moedim is a simple thing to do. Come on up, Spencer. And we're going to follow the pattern <coughs> given to us in Joshua chapter 6. When you hear the long blast of the shofar, Ruah, with a great, not an okay or an average or that wasn't bad, Ruah, with a great to Ruah. Before we do that, I want you to just close your eyes for a minute. I want you to get it down on the inside of you. Let it sink in so that you begin to see it. That this same Yeshua that ascended up, in like manner shall he descend. He was taken up, he's going to return, and when he comes back, he's coming back as a king. I want you to see that on the inside. <coughs> That he'll make every sacrifice, hardship, difficulty that you ever went through seem like nothing. He'll make all things right. The sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed by him, in him, to us. When you hear the sound of the shofar. Say this with me. Even so, Even so. Come, quickly. come quickly. I am Messiah. Hallelujah. That's a good shout. That's a great teruah. Hallelujah. Well, I'm not going to read it to you now. We're going to go ahead and uh, finish our celebration. And I don't know if you know that this isn't the only thing we're supposed to do. According to Nehemiah chapter 8, there's some other things we're supposed to do. So go home tonight, read the first, I think it's 12 verses or so, 15 verses or so of Nehemiah chapter 8. <clears throat> You'll find that on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra stood up and read from Torah. <clears throat> it caused the people to weep because they realized there were a lot of things in there that they didn't know was in there. And so they trespassed. It also caused them to weep because... There were some things in there that they knew were in there, but they kind of let them slip in their life, right? And so they began to weep. And when the people began to weep, they were encouraged to stop weeping. Stop crying because this day is a joyful day. This is a holy set-apart day to be joyful. They were told, quit the crying. Be joyful. And here's what he, here's what he told them to do. Eat, drink, and send portions. So to finish this celebration, we got to eat the fat. Eat the good stuff. I don't think it says eat till you get fat, but it, eat the good stuff is what eat the fat means. And, and then drink. And then send portions. So to finish this celebration, this weekend sometimes bless somebody. Do something for somebody. Take somebody out to eat. Carry them something you know they need. Buy them some groceries. Okay? But right now, let's eat and drink ourselves. We've already read the Torah portion. We've already shouted. All that's left to do is eat and drink. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. As his name is put upon you, so shall he himself bless you. Another shout. Hallelujah!